folks. Hello. Welcome back. Hello. Um, maybe we can maybe we can hear for, from one or two people from the audience. Um, do you think it's wrong it's wrong to kill? Somebody's pointing at Caroline. No. Anybody? Just raise your hand. What do you think? What came up for you guys? Even if it wasn't particularly germane to the question, even if you took quite a tangent. Yeah, six. I hope I get it through. So I think it's uh, wrong to kill an ideal, but then you mistake it for killing the body, for example, or, or uh, feelings. For example, if someone uh, make you feel angry, and then you just like, shit, I want to kill this person. Then the thing that you want to kill is that angry thought within your head that that vibrates within the head from the person, not necessarily the, the person, but you end up killing that person. Or when you uh, kill a revolutionary thinkers, uh, if you are like a, a party, a kind of party, and then someone stand against you, and you want to kill that person, and then you decide to kill every single person that had that idea that irritates you, then what you're trying to kill is is that idea. And then it's not a sustainable way of killing, I think, because then you would end up, the idea lives on. Like, the chances is that if you think someone is bad and that idea is bad with you, there's a fair chance that that idea is going to crop up, like, uh, among another person or in another decade or so. So it's just not sustainable to kill an ideal, but then you mistake it for killing the flesh. But then I think it, it's still okay m to kill if it's the war between just the flesh, like just the pure design, like the very basic, basic design, like uh, between animals killing one another. It's not they trying to kill an ideal, not like this lion irritates me, I'm going to kill that lion. It's not like that. So. Great, excellent. Thank you, Six. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Um, maybe somebody new, if that's all right, Truett. Yeah, if that's okay. Going once. Yeah, please. Yeah, George. So I think the notion of wrong and right with killing is probably more of a case-by-case -case type thing. But as far as killing other sentient beings go, the more inconvenience or adversity it brings to my life compared to this... Uh, compared to the like sentience of that creature. Hang on, I'm trying to phrase this properly. So a mosquito, right? Tiny, no, I can't empathize with it whatsoever, but it's a great amount of inconvenience relative to its sentience, so I'll just kill it with ease. But then something uh, more nutritionally valuable, like a cow or something, as far as humans go, it's much easier to... Oh, my phraseology's gone out the window. I'm trying to get a point across, but I can't articulate it very well. I think when you're bringing up the mosquito there, you're saying that uh, it's much easier for us to kill a mosquito than it is to kill a cow. Even though you know we do kill uh, loads of cows, um, it seems like it still is much more much harder for somebody to justify the the killing of a of a cow than it is to justify the killing of a mosquito. Something about its size, something about its intellect, something about um, maybe uh, uh, its supposed ability to suffer? Can a mosquito suffer in the way that a cow can suffer, in the way that a human can suffer? Who knows? Who knows? Um, maybe we'll hear from one more person, and then, we'll, and then we'll, we'll, we'll hop on back in. Yeah. I feel like regarding the mosquitoes and the cows, like it just how much you can relate to like the animal or something else. So like the mosquito like is something is almost alien to us. So like it doesn't feel like they're strange to kill it as much as a spider. Like if the spider was this big, you probably kill it as well, because like you can't relate to the eyes, to the way it's built and everything. A cow is much more similar to a human or like uh, a monkey as well. So like it makes it harder for us to kill it, mm. and then it also becomes like how distant you are from the action like of killing it. Like I mean like. You can uh, press a button, as we were saying, and kill 100 cows, and it's easier. If you have to go it yourself and kill a cow, it's probably very hard, and like, you wouldn't do it. And you would consider it wronger than just pressing a button. Yeah, certainly. And we had a talk. I'm so sorry, guys. I do. I do just. I do just need to move on for time. Um, we had a talk on on veganism just about four weeks ago, and uh, and we're probably going to repeat that talk at some point in the future, where I think a lot of these ideas are, are going to get to come up again. All right, guys. So so let's uh, let's see what Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita has to say about killing. Um, so this all stems from what Arjun who's this um, warrior prince, what he uh, feels to be conflicting demands of dharma. Okay, so what, 
what is Dharma? Has anybody heard this term before? Raise your hand. Dharma. Okay, cool. Um, would anybody like to give us a quick definition of Dharma? Okay, yeah, so the way or the path. So it's tantamount to something like the Tao that you might have in Taoism. Um, but of course, there's no real uh, equivalent in the English language. It's a very difficult word to translate. So um, there are loads of different translations that are out there. It seems like the way that the word Dharma is used in different ancient Indian uh, or Eastern texts in general, the way that it's used tends to be very different depending on the text. Um, it comes from the root dri, which which means to support, to hold up, or to bear. Um, and in that way, dharma, kind of etymologically, we could say, could be defined as that which supports. Now, and what we're talking about supporting here is like the whole universe. It's like th the whole universe will kind of shut down if people don't follow their dharma, that there is a divine or a cosmic order to things that must be followed. And if you follow these things, then the world will be held up, the world will be supported, and things will go well. If you actively fight against your own dharma, if you actively fight against the way things are supposed to be, um, that's when things begin to fall apart. Um, there's one definition which is that um, dharma is support from within, the essence of a thing, its virtue, that which makes it what it is. And Arjun here is a warrior, so he considers his dharma to be the warrior dharma, the dharma of a warrior. Um, dharma it can be said to be the actions constituting one's whole life, the way that you act. Sometimes, um, if someone is a Hindu and they have to uh, chant this chant 108 times, uh, they have to uh, do these certain rituals and these certain rites, um, some would call this the person's dharma, the way that they have to act. Um, in general, it's actually referring to the way you live your entire life, though, the actions that make up your whole life. So for Arjuna, he recognizes that he actually is, uh, he's at the face, he's facing two conflicting dharmas. So he is uh, a warrior, so he faces the, uh, and he must uphold what's called the, the warrior dharma. Um, so he is the prince and son of the god Indra, who's the, the god of war, um, and uh, he must follow this law of the war warrior, but also he's reluctant to kill his own family members because there's another recognized dharma, which is the law of kinship, the kula dharma. Um, and he sees that these two things are in conflict. So there are, um, if you remember in the story, I know, I know this is all going by very quickly, but in the story, He's in the center, and he looks at his enemies, and he sees that amongst his enemies are family members uh, and, uh, and friends and teachers, so he, he doesn't want to kill these other people, and he sees that there's this kind of conflict. And um, in response, he's tempted into inaction. He says that he just wants to completely renounce his role in society, move out into the woods. Um, so it's at this moment that Krishna his chariot driver, then reveals himself to be an incarnation of Lord Vishnu, a personified form or an avatar of Lord Vishnu, the supreme god, the god of everything. Um, and he's there to counsel Krishna. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't think I'll open this one up, actually, but I just want you to think about this one. When there are moral duties that appear to be in conflict, how do you personally decide what to do? You know, if, um, if, if, um, if you're running late for work and you think to yourself, oh, I could easily make up a story and I could lie to my boss, well, then you're, you're in this kind of conflict. Either you have to face being a liar or somebody who's going to get in trouble from your boss. Okay, so that's one kind of conflict, right? Or it could be the conflict of, you know, I love this person and I love this person and I, I, both of them have their benefits. I feel the same towards them. Um, I feel as though I need to choose one. How do I make this choice? Or perhaps it's a question of what path do I walk down? Do I live in Hanoi? Do I live in some other country? Um, how do I make this decision? Um, so h how do you make these decisions? Let's just keep that in our minds as we're going through. So Krishna's response at first is <laughs> he's, uh, he pokes, he says that 
Arjuna is going to be made fun of quite a lot. And um, there's a lot of text here. I'm going to read it, and we're going to break it down a little bit here. Um, so at first, Krishna, in response to Arjuna, um, he tries to appeal to his sense of pride. He says, the story of your dishonor, this is if, if you just leave, if you renounce this life, the story of your dishonor will be repeated endlessly. And for a man of honor, which you are, the prince of this entire clan, dishonor is worse than death. These brave warriors will think you have withdrawn from battle out of fear, and those who formerly esteemed you will treat you with disrespect. Your enemies will ridicule your strength and say things that should not be said. Now, in this translation, it's things that should not be said. In other translations, um, it actually says that they'll call him a eunuch or a, a man who's had his penis chopped off. Um, he says, what could be more painful than this? Okay. Now, in response, uh, Arjuna, this warrior, he says, uh, he says, yeah, okay, so you're appealing to uh, my, my warrior side, but this doesn't actually say anything about my family. So um, I, I need an answer that uh, somehow recognizes both my duties to my family and my duties as a warrior. And to this, Krishna says, and, and this is where we really open up to this first teaching, this death delusion, delusion teaching. Bhagavad Gita made up of these 18 different teachings. This is the first. He says, you speak sincerely, but your sorrow has no cause. The wise grieve neither for the living nor for the dead. There has never been a time when you and I and the kings gathered here have not existed, nor will there, nor will there be a time when we cease to exist. So the true essence of us is one that cannot die, that cannot be killed. Are, is there anybody here that feels this way already, actually, that we're something far beyond that which can be killed? Yeah, let's say half of us now, half of us. The other of us are kind of folding our arms and pouting. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> Krishna goes, goes on to say, nothing of non-being comes to be, nor does being cease to exist. The boundary between these two is seen by men who see reality. Our bodies are known to end, but the embodied self is enduring, indestructible, and immeasurable. Therefore, Arjuna, fight the battle. He's saying, you can't actually kill another person. You're not doing anything wrong by killing. You're not killing a person. You're not killing a self. You're just killing their bodies. You're just killing their bodies. Um, I'd, I'd like to say quickly here, too, um, if anybody, I, I know just a handful of us have actually read the Bhagavad Gita, it's actually very, very accessible. So these are directly from the text. I find it to be very easy to read. There are loads of commentaries out there. It's relatively short. You can finish it in just a couple of hours, and um, it, it really has some, some great chunks of wisdom. We're only looking at four of the 18 teachings here tonight, so I'd, I'd really recommend picking up a copy of this. Krishna goes on to say, he who thinks this self, a killer, and he who thinks it killed, both fail to understand. It does not kill, nor is it killed. It is not born, it does not die. Having been, it will never not be. Unborn, enduring, constant, and primordial. It is not killed when the body is killed. Everybody with this so far, any questions here? Everybody good, okay, cool, great. Krishna says, Arjuna, when a man knows the self to be indestructible, enduring, unborn, unchanging, how does he kill or cause anyone to kill? As a man discards, this is a great uh, analogy here that you actually hear a lot throughout uh, Hindu scripture. As a man discards worn out clothes to put on new and different ones, so the embodied self discards its worn out bodies to take on other new ones. Weapons do not cut it. Fire does not burn it. Waters do not wet it. Wind does not wither it. So the body that's killed in war, this is the same as just clothing, right, that we're wearing. You know, we, we can, our clothes might rip, and we might, set, we, you know, we might throw away our clothes and get new ones, but the, the we that are inside of our clothes, this stays the same. And he's saying this is the same as, our, bo as our, our physical bodies. Our physical body is just a shell placed on top of the pure self, uh, what's uh, in, in, in Sanskrit, in Hinduism, called the Atman, the pure, the soul, the, the, the pure self underneath of all of these shields, underneath of all of these layers and masks and delusions. And with all of that, 
we can move into um, our, oh, wait a minute, hold on. Is this a small group or is this a big one? Yeah, okay, yeah, this is a big one. Okay, so I'd like to hear from you guys now. Um, do you all personally believe that you are a living being? Oh, no, this is a small one. Okay, yeah, we're going to break up into small groups. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm getting a little lost here. Okay, do you believe that you are a living being who will one day die? What is death? And is death bad? You know? A lot of overlaps to our last discussion here, I think. Um, but we're, we're aiming towards a goal here. We're aiming towards a goal. Um, okay, so uh, a couple of things. So we're going to break up into small groups once again for this one. Give us a little bit more time. Um, I, uh, uh, it, does anybody have any haikus or drawings that they'd like to turn in? Yeah, one over here. Anybody else? One back here, two back here. So Truett's going to come around and grab these from you. Uh, and then we're, we're going to, uh, after we're finished with this small group discussion, we're going to have a little, a little contest and see who wins. Whoever wins is going to get a free drink. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, also, um, I want to make sure, did everybody get their parking ticket validated? Did anybody not get a little black X on your parking ticket? If you didn't, you're going to have to pay 10000 for parking when you, go to, when you go back to collect your bike. Oh, no. Uh, sorry, David. Um, if, uh, um, uh, so you can just come and talk to me if that's a problem. Um, all that being said, um, we have about 10 minutes for this one, um, and we'll, we'll come back in just a little bit. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. <laughs>